quarterly meetings that we're here in the governor's reception room for the first in-person meeting since the coronavirus pandemic began last year. Uh, day by day, we're experiencing more pre-pandemic life, and that is thanks to the willingness of a tremendous amount of Marylanders to get vaccinated. Right now, uh, nearly 77% of Marylanders over the age of 18 have received at least one uh, vaccine, and that's, there's over 3.5 million people in Maryland uh, that have already been fully vaccinated. However, the danger still looms uh, for those who have not been vaccinated, as well as presenting challenges to some of us who have been. Now, this week, the Department of Health reported that the state's seven-day positivity rate has climbed to above 2%. We have 309 new cases reported just today. The new cases are fueled primarily by the unvaccinated and those who are in contact with the Delta variant of the virus. In June, uh, this past June, the un unvaccinated Marylanders accounted for 100% of the COVID-related fatalities, 95% of the cases and 93% of the hospitalizations. So you can vastly reduce the possibility of becoming very sick, going into the hospital and potentially uh, passing due to COVID by getting vaccinated. They're readily available in pharmacies, local health departments, community-based clinics at no cost. So we continue to urge all those who are eligible to get vaccinated and get vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, you know, while the pandemic has had a tremendous impact on our daily lives, it's also had a significant impact on our challenges associated with the opioid epidemic. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently released data showing that 93,000 people died from drug overdoses in 2020. That's just a ship out in the... <laughs> <laughs> that is nearly a 30% increase in, in this year, this year from the year before. Uh, my comment, Robin, looked it bottled. I thought it was my phone. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, people, no, it's one of the tour, tourist vessels down there at the dock. We are in a port city. Right, right. Just to remind you. <laughs> uh, the opioid overdoses have accounted for 69,000 or two thirds of those deaths that I had mentioned just a few minutes ago. And as was reported in one of our previous meetings, uh, we were seeing a reduction, a leveling off, and then a reduction in the fatalities associated with opioid uh, overdoses. And in 2019, they were actually down from the year before. Uh, but we saw an 18% increase in 2020, which we believe is directly tied to the pandemic, the isolation, the anxiety, uh, all the challenges associated with the pandemic were exacerbated by those who were trying to recover from uh, opioid addictions. And in between January and March of this year, compared to 2020, we still saw a 5.7% increase and opioid related deaths. And so as that challenge has you know, increased, uh, we have to respond to the increased challenge. And so just last month, we announced Maryland Stop Overdose Strategy or Maryland SOS. Uh, Maryland SOS, we were seeking to leverage new and existing funding and local partnerships and experiences of Marylanders as we navigate this new chapter in, uh, in, in our response. Last week, uh, I joined the Opioid Operational Command Center and announced $5.5 in grants to support initiatives across the state to educate about the dangers of opioids, employ strategies that encourage individuals to make different choices and increase resources available for those who are seeking treatment. Our administration is focused on addressing the opioid epidemic and using every tool at our disposal 
And it is a critical mission that we support our partners in this effort who are committed to building a healthier and safer Maryland. In all, the Opioid Operational Command Center will provide $10 million in strategic funding for this fiscal year to address the opioid crisis and support uh, proven and promising initiatives that create measurable and meaningful change and help those most at risk of losing their lives to the, the opioid epidemic. Uh, next month, the Opioid Operational Command Center will begin holding regional town hall meetings uh, where state and local partners can hear directly from Marylanders about the approaches that are working and which are not. Uh, the feedback we receive during these town hall meetings will help inform our strategy going forward, as well as how the state utilizes funds received from the legal action related to the opioid crisis. The first town hall is going to be August 26th at Allegheny College, starting at 5.30 p.m. We chose Cumberland as our first location for the town hall in 2020 because Allegheny and Darren, as well as Washington County, saw a 46% increase in the opioid-related deaths uh, last year. In Allegheny itself, Allegheny County, saw the largest single percentage increase in fatalities in the state. <laughs> so during the town hall, the state will provide updates on the overdose picture in the region, efforts to address the epidemic, as well as the opioid uh, restoration, restitution fund. And our hope is to hear from stakeholders across the state to continue to adjust our response and to meet the needs as we battle substance use disorder. And I, I want to say that this is a similar approach that was taken in our first years in office uh, when uh, the governor asked me to chair the Emergency Heroin and Opioid Task Force. Uh, and we went around the state and listened to uh, the local officials, uh, individuals, parents, those who were also suffering from substance use disorder in terms of what their challenges were and how we could go about trying to address the, the, the the challenges at that point. And we did that starting, I think, in 2015. Um, as we, as I said, we saw some progress. We we're still working in those areas, but the pandemic has made it even more challenging. And so, you know, the uh, OCC, as we sometimes call it, is going back out to listen to stakeholders and work with our partners as we uh, address this particular issue uh, in the Maryland SOS program. So with that, I'm going to just take a moment to ask everyone who's here to identify themselves and, at their, and where they're from. Why don't we start with, uh, I think Russ is out there and coming in from the interworld somewhere. <laughs> I am. I'm truly virtual today. So uh, Russ Strickland, I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. Thank you. Maybe start. Come on. Robert Green, I'm Secretary of the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Jay Cleary, uh, Department of Juvenile Services, here on behalf of Secretary Sam Abbott. Reggie Burke from the Maryland Department of Education, here on behalf of State Superintendent, Mr. Children. Robin McCartney, Executive Director of the Opioid Operational Command Center, as the Lieutenant Governor said, the OCC. Olivia <laughs> <laughs> Jones, Deputy Secretary of the Behavioral Health Administration. Uh, Vanessa Lyon, uh, here on behalf of Executive Glenn Houston for the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth, and Victim Services. Bill Dolphmar, Maryland State Police, sitting here for Colonel Jones. Thank you. I understood you were caught up in traffic. Yes, sir. You didn't turn the lights on or anything. Yes, sir. Okay, did everyone, everyone have a chance to read the minutes uh, from the previous minutes being? Uh, are there any questions or uh, suggested changes? Uh, no, if not, do we have a motion to approve? Move for approval. That is for the last meeting. Sir. We have a second. I'll second it. Okay. Um, all those in favor of approval, say aye. Aye. Um, aye. Any opposed? And thank you. Okay. With that, uh, Next in order, um, I believe we're going to get the uh, update. 
Well, first, I, I should turn it over to uh, Robin Rickard, who, as uh, she mentioned, is uh, participating as the executive director of the Gilbert Operational Command Center for the first time as the executive director. Congratulations. Thank you. And I believe you're going to give a little update. Yes, at this sir. Point. Thank you. Welcome to the podium. I guess it's fine. I can do the podium or I can sit here. I just need to. Okay, can I have the clicker? Your staff. Oh, you're going to do it for me? That would be perfect. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and thank you to members of the council who are in person and virtually. Today, I will give you a quick update on the most recent opioid related numbers from the first quarter of this year, and I'll also share some updates about the exciting work our office is doing and what we've got planned for the rest of the summer and fall. And the Lieutenant Governor gave you a, a glimpse of, of what we've got going on. And of course, this does include the new public engagement campaign, Maryland SOS, or Maryland Stop the Widow Strategy. So the following slides, we're going to show the latest data that have uh, about the current state of the opioid crisis in Maryland. Everything shown here can be found on our recent report of our first quarter, and that is on our website, the words too late.maryland.gov. In the first quarter of 2021, there were 682 fatal overdoses in Maryland related to all types of drugs and alcohol, representing, as the Lieutenant Governor said, a 5.7 increase from the first quarter of 2020, when there were 645 overdoses. Sadly, it does appear that the effects of COVID-19 did um, continue to complicate the opioid crisis in the first three months of this year. There were 612 fatal overdoses that involved opioids um, during this time frame. This represents a 6.3% increase from the first quarter of 2020 when there was 576. Opioids were involved in 89.7% of all fatal overdoses. Looking at individual opioid or yeah, opioids by type, we can see that fentanyl continues to be the primary driver of the overdose mortality. Fentanyl-related deaths rose by 5.2% in the first quarter, an increase from 536 in the first quarter of last year to 564 this year. Fentanyl was involved in 92.2% of all opioid-related deaths or 82.7% of all fatal overdoses. Next, heroin-related deaths continued their steep decline, falling by 27.7% compared to the same time last year. Prescription opioids, in contrast, rose sharply, increasing 37.4%. This sharp increase is particularly troubling considering that prescription opioid-related deaths have been on the decline over the last uh, several years. If this trend were to continue through the end of the year, it would be the first time that prescription opioids related deaths outpaced heroin since 2011, and we are concerned about this, and we've had several emails with BHA and MDH. Looking at opioid-related fatal overdoses by county, you can see that the increases in the first quarter was not felt evenly across the state. As you can see in the table, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Anne Arundel experienced the highest number of opioid deaths with 227, 89, and 57, respectively. Together, these counties accounted for 60.9% of all opioid-related deaths in Maryland. Baltimore City, unfortunately, saw um, an increase of 8.6%, which exceeded the statewide average. Queen Anne's County had a very troubling 600% increase in opioid-related deaths, though to be cautious, this involves a relatively small number of cases. Along the same line, St. Mary's, Carroll, Wacomico, Talbot, and Calvert counties also saw Significant increases, however, um, they also experience relatively few fatal overdoses compared to the larger jurisdictions. Nine jurisdictions saw decreases during the time frame, which is encouraging. They include Prince George's, Washington, Charles, Howard, Dorchester, Allegheny, Garrett, Worcester, and Caroline counties. Caroline County reported zero opioid-related fatal overdoses during this time frame, which is a 100% decrease. Opioid-related fatal overdose trends also vary by region um, across Maryland in the first quarter of 2021. The largest numerical increase was observed in Central Maryland, which reported a total of 419 regional deaths. This represents an 8.5% increase, which was primarily led by Baltimore City. 
The largest regional percent increase was observed in Southern Maryland, which saw 57.1% overdose death, uh, deaths compared to the first quarter of last year. However, 22 deaths, Southern Maryland also had the lowest total of opioid-related deaths in the state. The Capital Region reported 79 opioid-related fatalities from January to March of this year. This was one death fewer than in the first quarter of 2020, or a 1.3% decrease. The Eastern Shore saw a regional increase of 16%, with 58 total opioid-related fatalities. And lastly, Western Maryland reported the second fewest number of opioid-related fatal overdoses in the first quarter of 2021. They reported 34 such deaths in the first quarter, 26.1% fewer than this time in 2020. And I was telling the Lieutenant Governor earlier, I hope that um, that, that keeps up, because as he told you, in 2020, it was a 45% um, increase. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at Western Maryland. We're going to be going out to the town hall meetings, and I'm interested to find out what they're doing, that their numbers are coming down this first quarter. Now looking at non-opioids, we saw something of a mixed bag the first quarter. There were 223 cocaine-related deaths in the first three months of 2021, representing a welcome 6.7% decrease from the same time frame of 2020. Cocaine continues to account for the most non-opioid-related fatalities. There was 128 alcohol-related deaths, a decrease of 8.6 from the first quarter of 2020. There were 30 benzodiazepine-related deaths in the same time frame, representing a 6.3% decrease. Methamphetamine-related deaths increased by 35%, with 27 deaths. I was on a um, ONDCP call last week, and all the northeastern states are actually seeing the same thing, the uptick, uptick in uh, methamphetamine cases. And lastly, there were 13 PCP-related deaths during the same time frame, representing an increase of 85.7%. Now, if we switch gears, the next two slides look at non-fatal overdoses in Maryland in the first quarter. Maryland saw significantly more hospital emergency department visits for non-fatal opioid-related overdoses in the first three months of 2021. As you can see, there were 2,397 visits from January through March, which is a 17.8% increase from the first quarter of 2020. It's important to note that all uh, emergency department visits were down for all types of cases in the first quarter of 2020 the pandemic. Next up, looking at EMS naloxone administrations, there were 2,354 total naloxone administrations by EMS personnel in the first quarter. This represents a 4.6% increase from the same time frame in 2020 when there was 2,250 such cases. The largest monthly increase occurred in March, which saw a 13.8% more EMS um, administrations compared to March of last year. Uh, the next few slides contain data on race, gender, and age demographics for opioid-related fatal overdoses. In the first quarter, opioid-related overdoses increased substantially among non-Hispanic Black Marylanders, while decreasing slightly among non-Hispanic White Marylanders. Although these numbers are preliminary, this could represent a, a turn to a trend that we were seeing before the pandemic, a trend of white disparities and overdose mortality. And I'll address this more in the next slide, but as we've seen in recent years, opioid-related deaths have largely decreased among white Marylanders while increasing among black Marylanders. In the first quarter, opioid-related fatal overdoses grew the most among other non-Hispanic race groups by percentage. But as you can see, the cohort had a relatively small number of deaths. Looking at gender, trends have remained consistent as compared to previous years. Opioid-related deaths involving males vastly outnumbered those involving females by about a three to one margin. Looking at age, you can see that opioid deaths increased the largest, um, increased by the largest margin numerically and by percentage among people. Um, in the ages of 45 and 54. And lastly, while the percentage of opioid-related deaths increased substantially among uh, people under the age of 25, again, the, this cohort has uh, significantly fewer fatal overdoses than all other age cohorts. As I mentioned on the previous slide, we have seen a widening disparity in opioid-related fatal overdoses, uh, overdose rates by race in recent years. As you can see, through 2017 and uh, 2019, the number of 
reproduces among non-Hispanic white uh, Marylanders fell by 11%, while increasing by 40% among non-Hispanic Black Marylanders. This trend appears to have been disrupted by um, the pandemic, when opioid-related deaths increased uh, by similar margins for both non-Hispanic White and non-Hispanic Black Marylanders by about 18% for both groups. This quarter's numbers may represent, um, again, a return to the pre-pandemic trends if they were to persist through the end of the year. And that concludes my data portion of the presentation. Again, you can find all this data um, in our report for the first quarter. But before I wrap up, I just want to share some of the updates. Uh, first, I'm excited again to mention the Maryland Stop Overdose Strategy, the Maryland SOS. Uh, we are going to be hitting the regional town hall in areas hit hardest by the opioid crisis, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned. And again, these, uh, the goal is to hear directly from Marylanders about what they feel is needed in their communities, what's working and what isn't, and um, educating the public about the Opioid Restitution Fund, which was established in 2019 to manage all funds that Maryland receives from the litigation against the opioid manufacturers and distributors. We already received $12 million earlier this year, and much more is anticipated in the years to come. Um, there are restrictions about how the funds can be used, and we want to educate uh, the community about what they can expect to see in the future. The legislation that established the Opioid Restitution Fund specifies that funds can only be used for a variety of programs, which you can see listed here. I'm not going to read them all to you, but um, some of the most critical areas include peer programs, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, or ESPER increasing access to medications used to treat opioid use disorders, such as buprenorphine and methadone, the Maryland's Heroin Coordinator Program, Mobile Crisis, school education, and school education campaigns. And many of these programs are already being implemented at the local level across Maryland, and we are very excited about the opportunity to expand them wherever we possibly can. We're gonna have a lot more information about Maryland SOS in the coming weeks. Um, and as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, the first one is August 26, and we're going to be announcing the other locations in the near future. And um, we did uh, recently announce our awards through our Black and Competitive Grant programs. Um, and also beginning next month, actually on Tuesday, because next month is next week. Um, opioid Intervention Team Coordinator Teresa Keith and I will be restarting our annual visits with the OITs across the state. I believe we go to Allegheny County um, to, uh, next Tuesday morning. We're going to be hitting the road and meet with local leaders in every jurisdiction to help share best practices, learn what uh, all about the local initiatives that they're making. And um, next, the OCC is in the beginning phases of crafting the state's interagency coordination plan 2022. In the coming weeks and months, we will begin working closely with all of our partners, everyone here, um, uh, state and local, to identify our most critical priorities for addressing the overdose morbidity and mortality in the uh, year to come. And if you want more information about that process, you can reach out to our Deputy Director, Marian Gibson. And lastly, the OOCC just launched our new and exciting opioid data dashboard on our website. This is a tool that is very similar to the state's coronavirus dashboard. It visualizes all the data from our quarterly reports and we'll be updating it quarterly. And again, you can check that out through our website, reports to my remarks. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, uh, I think now we're going to turn to uh, Dr. Leah Jones uh, for an update on the uh, racial disparities of this task force. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, well, thank you all for your for the time to speak. I just wanted to give you an update on uh, this task force, uh, which began uh, back in February 2021. Thank you, Robert, for uh, sharing and inf the information and reminding us about the need for this particular task force, as unfortunate as it might be. Um, to continue to address the escalating increase in overdoses in the Black community, particularly since the onset of, uh, or since the arrival of fentanyl. Uh, so we met, started meeting back in February. We've had four meetings uh, to date. Uh, we have a very um, broad group of members uh, who are lending their support uh, to, this, to this task. 
uh, the first several meetings focused on level setting with our members about data related to racial disparities, bringing everybody kind of up to speed uh, about overdose information, providing an, uh, information about the landscape of services, because we do have a diverse uh, stakeholder group. So most of our membership are not people who are directly connected to the opioids, opioid epidemic, opioid treatment. And that was deliberate. Uh, and so our last meeting on July the 7th was our first in-person meeting. Uh, we were joined by Dr. Cheryl West, who is an organ who has a PhD in organizational leadership, who facilitated an interactive session to help us uh, to think through how we want to use our work groups for uh, this uh, for the task force. Um, so our work groups are going to be focused on um, the four goals of the task force. And uh, I don't think that you all have heard the updated version of our goals. And so the first, uh, so there's four. The first one is identifying focused data-informed interventions, which include programs and policies, as well as to seek out innovative pilot emerging projects that will reduce the disparity and overdose fatalities in the Black community, which has been showing escalating rates of death despite statewide interventions. Second goal is recommending programs and policies that will decrease factors contributing to the disparity in overdose deaths that reflect and include community voice and insights and address the structural determinants of drug use. Number three, determining how to increase acceptance of evidence-based practices for opioid use disorders in affected communities using a tailored approach. And lastly, considering historical inequities, ensure equitable allocation of resources to combat the opioid crisis. Um, so um, we spent the time um, looking at those four goals um, and uh, identifying what are the questions, what's the work of these groups. And so each group uh, came up with at least 15 to 20 questions that make up the work of the work groups. Um, and we believe that if the groups answer these questions, then we will get at the, the recommendations that we need for purposes of being effective to our mission. Um, and lastly, our next meeting is going to be uh, on Wednesday, August 18th, and we are on track to identify our final recommendations uh, to this body by March of next year, and we'll complete our final report by the summer of next year as well. <coughs> Any questions for Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to transition to Marianne Gibson, uh, Deputy Director of the Opioid Operations Command Center. And Michael Baer, Director of Focus Coordination, Behavioral Health Administration, for the presentation uh, on overdose risk. This is the overview of data for overdose risk mitigation initiative. Don't worry. So, call it another. <laughs> Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Rutherford and members of the Interagency Coordinating Council for having me here today. I'm Mary Ann Gibson with the Opioid Operational Command Center, and my colleague, Michael Bayer from the Behavioral Health Administration, and I will be providing an overview of the Data Informed Overdose Risk Communication Initiative. First, I'm going to give some background information on the DORM project, and then Michael will provide a high level overview of the findings from our recent report. Then we'll conclude the presentation with an overview of some program level data, and we'll talk about the next steps for advancing this initiative. So quickly beginning with an overview. House Bill 922, which was referred to as Chapter 211, was signed into law by Governor Hogan during the 2018 legislative session. We have since renamed this initiative the Data Informed Overdose Risk Communication, or DORM Report. The goal of this initiative is to better understand common overdose risk factors, which can enable us to more strategically allocate resources and direct policy to reduce overdose mortality. We'll do this by linking overdose death records from 18 different systems level data sets maintained by multiple state agencies. Uh, this will help us then develop overdose risk profiles. The legislation also requires that the Maryland Department of Health develop an annual report to highlight these findings. Earlier this year, the OOCC was tasked with overseeing the DORM initiative so that we could help increase collaboration serving in our role as an interagency coordinating body. 
To advance this project, the OOCC worked very closely with BHA to produce the first storm report, which was delivered to the General Assembly in late, 2000, or late June 2021. For this report, we were able to include linked over to step records with the following data sets. Health Services Cost Review Commission, or HSCRC, Maryland's Public Behavioral Health System data set, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, Maryland Medicaid claims, and overdose death records provided by the Division of Parole and Probation. We were also able to include data on program-based and community-based NOx distribution and syringe services programs. And lastly, we included data from the statewide unintentional drug overdose records surveillance system, also known as SUDORS. SUDORS provides an overview of the industry and occupation of overdose decedents. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Michael to provide an overview of the HSCRC, PBHS, PDMP, and Medicaid findings. Thank you, Barry. So I'm Michael Bear with MDH Behavioral Health Administration. So I want to give a quick overview of some of the highlights of the findings from this report. And starting with some data that was based on the linkage of the overdose death records with the uh, hospital case mix data from the Health Services Cost Review Commission. So these are records of um, hospital inpatient admissions, emergency, excuse me, emergency department encounters statewide. And what we wanted to do was pro to provide a basic snapshot of the proportion of overdose decedents who had some interaction with the hospital system and what types of services they were provided. Also an indication of you know, what they were going uh, to a hospital for in the first place. So looking at uh, uh, overdose deaths between 2016 and 2020, what you're seeing here is the percentage of those overdose decedents annually who we found records for in the hospital case mix data, and it breaks it down by the type of service they were provided. So again, these are annual numbers uh, looking at the deaths and the services they were provided hospitals during the year of their death. So it's not a full retrospective, but just during the year of death. So between uh, 2016 and 2020, we're looking at between 45 and 55% of overdose decedents had a hospital encounter for any reason. Uh, between 25% and 31% had an overdose related encounter. So, you know, rough up, up to about a third of those decedents. 32% to 36% had an encounter in which they received an opioid use disorder diagnosis to give you a sense of, at least at the hospital, the recognition uh, that they, they had an OUD. Um, substance use disorder diagnoses other than opioid use disorder, looking at 44 to 46% of overdose decedents during that time frame. So again, slightly higher than just that specifically focused on OUD. Uh, the last three get to some other conditions, you know, sort of outside of the substance use realm that were we found pretty noteworthy. Uh, for between 28 and 31% of overdose decedents had were uh, treated for a non-poisoning non related injury. So this is these are uh, things uh, injuries other than uh, poisoning was and we found out significant as well. Fifteen percent to seventeen percent had a chronic pain diagnosis, and lastly, something that you know we see turning up in multiple different data sets when we link the overdose death data to it is this high rate of. Uh, of uh, indicators of mental health disorders. I don't think that would be a surprise to many people. 40% to 43% of decedents in that time range uh, had a diagnosis for mental health disorder. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. The data, does that include data that would come from EMS, where EMS may not have, they may have responded to a overdose, person survived and didn't Refuse service. Yeah, my, to my knowledge, the city would not include that. Okay. They weren't actually transported to the hospital. Okay. Because it would be interesting that probably the numbers would be even higher. That's right. Okay, so a little bit more information coming out of the, the analyses from the HFCRC data. This is looking at uh, the risk of fatal overdose and the impact on fatal overdose risk of prior non-fatal overdose. So really here we're confirming what the literature has shown 
across the country for many years now is that previous non-fatal overdose is one of, one of the highest risk factors for actually dying from, a, uh, from an overdose. We're seeing that here. Uh, it breaks it down by the different uh, uh, drugs uh, that were coded for those non-fatal overdose incidents, heroin, uh, and there's some limitations to that now, but I think on the left-hand side, you see heroin 8.5 times the risk if you had a heroin-related non-fatal over, uh, non overdose. Um, and again, I, that's, I just think indicates that this is one area to really focus on in a way. It can be at the clinical level, you know, with, with patients and looking at prior history of non-fatal overdose as really you know, focusing on them as a high-risk individual. And I just think in our public health surveillance as well, you know, looking for hot spots of non-fatal overdose, digging into that more because that is really an indicator of where you see concentration of risk for overdose death. So now we're looking at some results from the linkage of the death data with the Medicaid claims data. So uh, the first high-level finding here is that for uh, Overdose deaths in 2019 alone, or just the 2019 overdose decedents, 67% uh, were in, enrolled in Medicaid at any point during 2019, and 64% were enrolled at the time of the death. So again, it's confirming what we've seen a lot in the past. We have a, a, a substantial proportion of people who died of overdose death are within the Medicaid population. And next bullet down speaks to uh, uh, basically the uh, access to treatment for opioid dis use disorder with medications, also use medications for opioid use disorder or MOUD. And 38.7% of decedents in 2019 uh, who were enrollees actually received a medication for opioid use disorder. That includes methadone, uh, buprenorphine, or long-acting naltrexone. 23% uh, of those who received an MOUD have received buprenorphine. So again, buprenorphine makes up a substantial portion of those that actually receive uh, medications. Next, I'm going to move into uh, results from the linkage with the PDMP data. Uh, I'll like to turn out here. So we, we took a slightly different approach with the PDMP data. Um, this is showing data again for overdose decedents from 2019 and whether they, they had a record in the PDMP of having received any controlled substance prescription going back five years to when the PDMP first started 2014, 2015. So we found that uh, of those 2019 overdose decedents, 64% had at least one prior controlled substance prescription in the PDMP. But then we further broke it down by the proportion of that 64% who had been dispensed a controlled substance at least six months prior to their death. And that percentage is 35% of the total of all 2019 overdose decedents. So to me, that says that, you know, A, uh, uh, people who die from overdose are, have a lot of interaction with health care providers, are receiving controlled substance prescriptions, and a substantial portion of them are receiving prescriptions uh, in, in uh, you know, very close to the time of death or currently. This isn't just a, re a reflection of having been prescribed controlled substances years prior. And we don't have a slide in the, uh, on this specifically, but these percentages hold up when you're looking at overdose decedents and the substances that cause the death as well. So not just people who died from prescription drug-related overdoses. I mean, look at those who died from you know, uh, fentanyl-related overdoses, we still see very high rates of receipt of, uh, of controlled substance prescription. So these are results from linkage of the death data with uh, the data for the uh, claims data from the public publicly funded behavioral health system. So again, we're looking uh, at 2019 overdose decedents. And in the first bullet, we're looking for claims that they may have had going back to 2016 in that data set. So we found that 56.8% uh, of decedents had a PBHS claim at some point going back to those 30 years. Of those, uh, 43, oh, excuse me, 40.3% had a claim within 30 days of their death. 
So again, we're seeing that yeah, even though uh, uh, with us, you know, for your look back period, we're seeing a majority having a claim, a, 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 excuse me, a sizable portion of them were engaged in services very recently before their death. And the last bullet speaks to uh, the fact that when we're looking at overdose decedents in the PBHS data, we're finding that a very high percentage of them were not just receiving services for substance use disorder, but they were receiving both mental health and substance use disorder services. So again, an indication, I think, of the uh, prevalence of co-occurring disorders among this, pop this very high risk population. 77, uh, over 77% of the seniors in 2019 had received both mental health and substance use services. Thank you, Michael. So for the next part of the presentation, I'm going to walk us through some program level data and then discuss next steps for the project. Beginning with an overview of community-based naloxone distribution, also referred to as Authorized Overdose Response Programs, or ORPs. Under the leadership of Aaron Russell with the Center for Harm Reduction Services, Maryland has been a leader in community-based naloxone distribution. At the time of the report publication, Maryland had 113 authorized ORPs in every jurisdiction in the state. Over 142,000 doses of naloxone were distributed through ORPs in 2000. 20, which was an increase over previous years. This is impressive um, given the complications caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Community outreach workers and mobile health departments had to pivot their strategy to distribute naloxone and um, they were really very successful. So um, this is a map illustrating naloxone saturation. The Center for Harm Reduction Services began utilizing what is referred to as the naloxone saturation formula, which is the statistical measurement used to track how well naloxone is reaching high-risk populations. The formula is based on a study that showed that communities witnessed a significant reduction in overdose fatalities when they achieved naloxone saturation. And naloxone saturation is defined as distributing naloxone at a rate of 9 to 20 times the number of fatalities reported in a given community specifically targeting people who are likely to witness an overdose. The Center for Harm Reduction Services is currently tracking naloxone saturation by county in Maryland to identify jurisdictions that are not reaching saturation. They're also working to provide technical assistance and to add additional resources where needed. In 2020, nine jurisdictions did not reach naloxone saturation. Seven jurisdictions were between zero and 49% above saturation targets. Three jurisdictions achieved naloxone saturation between 50 and 100% of their target, and five jurisdictions achieved more than 100% of their targeted naloxone saturation. So the last data set that we'll review is from the statewide unintentional drug overdose records surveillance system, or SUDORS. The SUDORS database is a component of the enhanced state opioid overdose surveillance system used by the CDC. It's used to track information on toxicology, death state investigations, and other risk factors that may be associated with overdose mortality. This particular SUDORS extraction is from the 2018 data set. And the data showed that among death records that indicated an occupation, instruction was the most commonly cited regardless of race or geographic location. The second most common sector does vary by jurisdiction of residence. On the Eastern shore, the retail trade was identified as the second most common occupation. In Western Maryland, West Central Maryland, and in Anne County, it was the accommodation and food service industry. And in Baltimore City and Baltimore County and the capital region, not in the workforce was the second most common answer. And to wrap up, I'll just go over some next steps. So the recap that Michael and I um, provided today was the information was collected and analyzed as part of phase one of the DORM initiative. And currently we're beginning work of phase two. Right now we are finalizing contracts with the Bloomberg School of Public Health 
to um, help us conduct more advanced analyses, which will link two or more data sets. And additionally, we will be developing a steering committee and a data quality committee to help guide the direction of the project. We're very excited to continue to elevate this work, and we do believe that the findings will help the state be more strategic in how we direct resources to address the opioid and overdose crisis. So that concludes our presentation, and we're happy to answer any questions. Um, just another potential data source, and I don't know how there's any restrictions associated with it. Um, the uh, whatever GoCap is now called, but obviously it used to be crime control prevention, it's crime prevention, people and children, <laughs> whatever it's called. But, they used to get, or probably still do get, some information from law enforcement uh, because many uh, law enforcement agencies respond to an overdose and treat it as a crime scene. And so, they, you know, even if it's non fatal, and um, I know at one point, and we talked about this with the MD Think uh, initiative with health and human services, I think juvenile services and public safety are involved in that is that there's data that possibly a social worker can see when a person comes in seeking uh, emergency uh, funding of some sort or housing assistance or something of that nature that the records can show that this person has had multiple overdoses. And in some cases, it comes from these different sources out there. Um, I know that the health records through HIPAA, and then if you are suffering from substance use disorder, there's additional protections of that data. Uh, but this is law enforcement data. Uh, so I don't, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if you're getting that. And then the question is, how do you use it? It tells us something. We can use it internally, but I don't know if that means you can go and actually proactively go to this person who has had three overdoses, let's say, in a four-month period. And they survive, and you know there's a high chance that they're not going to survive. What is the name of that data set? Um, well, we have several different ones, but I think so. You have access to the heroin coordinators, right? Yes, and that is a big part of that. So we can definitely get them together and make sure that you're utilizing it the best way possible. Great. If, if, if I may, yes, in, in the, I think your question about responses. Of, of ambulances, many of our volunteer ambulance companies all around the state, and a very con contemporary event for, for me. A uh, conversation is that that, that computer aided dispatch CAD data is that possibly within these 113 local programs? So, speaking to some some, some county individuals, a lot of ambulance service to our, our facilities, obviously, but it is. Um, going to multiple events where the individual there's a you're interceding in an overdose the individual is not being transported that is recorded in computer aided dispatch i am not uh, i don't know how it's closed so perhaps from mr strickland and maybe embedded in some of these local programs and i think we're going to visit uh, robin that that we may find that information but listening to a, an ambulance company that says we've been with this individual three times in the last week I believe there are some best practices of where there are um, actions that are taken, but it could be a, a, an excellent source of additional information based on how that call for service is closed. Um, so I just just add that as, as a, having done a bit of that in my previous life, um, uh, that, that I think it could be beneficial. Absolutely. And we do plan to add MIMS data as part of phase two. And what do you want to talk about the data that we have as well? Yes. Um, so we have had some conversations about uh, 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 getting access to data from GPCS, whether it's incarceration records or uh, community supervision, and also um, criminal history of which we had part of uh, DPSCS on a previous, previous project very similar to this. So that was a very um, valuable data set or data multiple data sets that we have access to. And we're very happy to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I know you've been working with our data director, Angelina, and, and uh, Sharina, she does an excellent job with that. But I'm thinking this this calls for service CAD data. I'm, I'm not quite legally up to speed as how it's defined, but it's a it's, it's a call for service. It's a dispatch and it's closure. And, and how that call is closed is very important. But, but I, I, I can tell you in recent conversations, there are many of those calls that are closed, as the governor noted. That uh, it's it's not a it's not a transport, but they're interceding in an overdose event, um, and I think that would be a very interesting number to know, especially with <coughs> our volunteer um, ambulance companies and, and everything around the state, how they're responding. Yeah, and do you think that would be housed through MEMS or is yeah. that MEMS? I think Russ could. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. 100%, that would be back to MIMS and Dr. Delbridge because that would be a refusal. So there is a, the EMS system does track that and would have accounting of that, as well as depend upon the individual jurisdiction, um, but Secretary Green is correct that it may also be closed out on a CAD report as a, a non-transport. Well, we'll certainly broach that when we have our initial conversations with MIMS. And I guess get to maybe I'm just too far in the, um, in the weeks, but uh, on the ground, you know, how can we use some of that data in terms of intervention? Would it be the OITs, would it be peer recovery? But then it's can you share that data outside of government? Uh, it's healthcare data, I don't think you can share it outside of government. These are you know, non government employees. I know at one point, Anne Arundel County was, uh, if a person had a non-fatal overdose, that the county health department would try to contact the person after they were released with uh, peer recovery or just offering services. Um, yeah, that's the Overdose Survivors uh, Initiative uh, that's right. funded by BHA. Um, through um, a vendor called Mosaic, and we have those OSAP services funded through a, a large number of emergency departments, departments across the state, looking to try to get into every emergency department um, with the full suite of services for folks who have the ED, with um, uh, not just op with opioid overdoses, but those who have substance use disorder, and the department, as many of them do, uh, mm -hmm. uh, provide those uh, information. And we're also working with Chris right now on an approved use case to send notifications of individuals who survive non fatal overdoses. Those alerts would go to the local health departments okay. to then facilitate some sort of outreach as well. So, yeah. and, that, and that's also going to be in, in one of the Chris updates. Um, if a patient has had a, has had an overdose within a certain window of time, and it goes back some period of time, whenever anyone goes in to prescribed for their, if they're looking at the PDMP, they will be alerted that this person has a history of uh, overdose. Um, I think that we'll probably need to do a better job in making sure that providers know what to do with that information. So just because it's there, you know, what, what's what's the recommendation? So I think that that's something that, mm -hmm. that, we, that we should uh, to work to develop. That's a very good point because if the individual, and let's say the provider is a primary care physician, if the individual doesn't know that this person has you know, a history of substance use disorder and the patient doesn't tell them, uh, they come in with a broken arm or their shoulders out of place so that they can be prescribed something. And they may have done that to themselves to get a prescription. And to be honest with you, it doesn't even have to be that um, that involved in the deception. I mean, the majority of people who have a history of opioid overdose, if they go to their primary care doctor, their doctor will still prescribe them opioid. That's when the literature shows, the majority of them. So it's, it's a very complex problem. Thank you. Um, we, uh, I have a lot of time. Um, but I just want to, you know, I do want to you know, open it up to just kind of you know, general conversations in terms of what we can do in terms of working together in our agencies, working together 
uh, to try to you know, address this. I know that the, the ARC is kind of you know, the ground force is on the ground working with the locals and uh, the other agencies as well as collecting the data. But you know, I know in various areas, you know, Secretary Green uh, sees it, you know, the individuals who are coming into his facilities. And speaking of which, I, have, I saw that the um, Institute of the Utilization of Canines, uh, is that exclusively for um, alcohol or is it including other substances? Uh, other substances. We, we have um, um, 36 dogs that are trained canine that are trained in various substances to detect them within our system. And, and through COVID, we saw this, this, this escalation of alcohol. Um, dangerous forms of alcohol um, uh, that, that was being, we'll give you the recipe, but we can find it, obviously, <laughs> and, and how you fermented a lot of uh, ability to uh, have individuals have their meals in their cells to um, slow down co-mingling. To that end, we didn't need any additional resources. We took a resource that we already had out of necessity and trained them in detection of alcohol in our system. And uh, we've had overdoses in our system from alcohol, a number. And uh, since doing so, uh, they've been in operation for six weeks. So along with everything else that they're trained to do within our system, they're able to detect ethyl alcohol as well. So uh, we've increased our detections three times that of the previous year in six weeks. So uh, it's just another thing that we can use to help keep our system safe um, uh, and no additional resources other than the time to train. We do. Um, we, a lot of times we see that there's a lot of multiple doors to get into our system. And uh, the, the primary one that we'll see is, is a uh, detention intake. That means to use this pet uh, to involve with law enforcement. And uh, we're able to see that right away because a lot of times they're on the substances as they are taken in yeah. to the detention facility. Um, you know, our medical director is kind of involved, has been very much involved in, in following opioids and the various substances that, uh, that, that are used. Um, we're thankful that the numbers aren't high. Uh, it's very low for our kids, but what we found that they are very uh, have very acute needs. They are very uh, addicted, and we are able to uh, do a lot of detox within our facility. Of course, under uh, strict medical guidance, and we have done that. We, and actually, our medical director is one of the pioneers of that in the juvenile system for around the country. They, they consult, other systems consult with her on how to do the same thing. Um, I will add that I thought it occurred to me when I was listening to the presentations, you know, we've been wrestling with this for years. It was a challenging situation. And I think that um, I think we've done a lot of good with the naloxone distribution. We have that in all of our facilities and uh, in our community offices, but there is that mental health component to it. And that, I think you know, that's what ratchets up the complexity. I, and I'm speaking from the juvenile side, when we have young people come in with these very acute uh, substance use disorder, there's always a trauma and mental health component to it. And really, if you can kind of, I don't say solve that, but address that and work through that, it's kind of amazing the substance use issue I don't say disappears, but it gets controlled and, and manageable from there. So if you don't deal with the trauma first, you, it's really hard to address the substance use issue. Yeah, yeah there's a reason to turn it to the substance use right. issue. Right. Now, in terms of that young person coming in, uh, are you informing the parent or guardian or next to can that this is a challenge we've you know, diagnosed with you? One. Yes, I mean that. There's always the parent or caretaker involvement. It's put into our system so that the, the case manager, every youth that gets involved in our system, gets a case manager, and that's like a little flag in the database. And then that that informs our entire treatment program for the youth throughout their stay with us, and then into the community as well. Um, so there's. Basically, once you have that flag, we're monitoring it very closely throughout. 
If I can ask a question, do the parents get in the lock zone as well when the kids get out of detention? So it, it's not a, a blanket thing, but if we identify youth as a high risk and we have, uh, we will give uh, basically a little naloxone training at the community office. And uh, I can tell you one case in particular that saved a young woman's life. That the mother was trained that morning. And uh, unfortunately, the, the young lady somehow got access within you know, like 24 hours of being released. And thank goodness the mom had the naloxone. It was just enough until the medical personnel arrived. But that was absolutely something that we do. We will do a quick little training and, and give them the whole the, the naloxone. So hopefully that they don't have to use it, but they have it. I can see that on your side too. So we, we've tremendously spent one of the recent grants for our division of parole and probation. So it really the big community eyes and ears of, of our department is, is our 800 plus agents in the community from one end of the state to the other. Um, uh, a recent recipient of grants, uh, um, locks and training. Um, I, I would tell you they're a wonderful resource. They're not only dealing with the person under our supervision, the family with that holistic approach. Um, and uh, another resource that I think is, is bearing fruit, I, I would tell you, I would get from Ms. Danner, who's very passionate, Director Danner, about this issue, probably at least once every two weeks or so, a success story there, where there's been an intervention directly um, associated with the training, the access, and uh, their knowledge of what they can do to help people. I would invite you, if, if you would like uh, Robin and your, your tours, to visit those offices in all the counties as well. Um, we could set, set up some things. It's very enlightening when, when I get there and understand really the depth of their interaction with the individual, with their families, and uh, they, they become a distribution of uh, a source of lots of information <laughs> and resources around this issue. We actually have a meeting with the National Governors Association after this meeting because um, they're going to be providing the technical assistance in that <laughs> yes. technical program. You know, one of the things that I guess wasn't mentioned is that risk, those risk categories are those individuals coming out of the criminal justice system. That, you know, I know that there were statistics at least a while ago, data is probably old, but there was a high percentage of individuals who come out of the criminal justice system if they went in there with a substance use disorder, even if they've gone through detox and they've gone through you know, other treatment. There's still a high likelihood that they're going to you know, succumb to an overdose when they get out, uh, and, and part of it kind of just using the you know, colloquialism is that they're thinking now almost every day, "I'm going to get high when I get out." You know, their their body may not be telling them that, but they are saying, "I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that." And they detox, so they can't quite handle what they used to handle. And you know they may just get that you know additional uh, fentanyl that they didn't, they weren't using before, and that fentanyl could be in the cocaine, let alone like the heroin that they think they're getting. So uh, I didn't see that in your data, but uh, <coughs> something that's another risk group. So it's eighteen. You can. Is it up to eighteen or? <laughs> we'll be including that in these two. Oh, okay. And we do have the, you know, it's an HB 116 the legislation that has us working with the um, PCS to get the yeah. medications for opiate disorders and all of the, uh, the penal institutions in the state. So I'm not going to mention that there. I think we're in four, I would say. Um, and in the goal, I think we need to have another two before the end of the year. But COVID really um, it, uh, dampened that effort. Um, but that still is the requirement of the legislation for all the institutions to have access to all three medications for opioid use disorder. And understand not all of those are obviously ours, that, that local connection from the pretrial facilities over around the state. And I know we haven't just met with the Draw ward because that is their focus of, of trying to do that. And obviously, in the city where we operate with the pretrial program, but it is a, a challenge post COVID um, getting all of those up and running. But uh, I believe we're at four and coming up on two more, it's going to be six yeah. of, of the local institutions within the state. And hopefully, they will be able to 
provide us a source of their data and what they're doing as well. Environment. Yeah. So one of the things I know that we are doing at the state level is really ramping up our mental health and social emotional supports. I mean, the past 15 months, it's obviously you and many students are being out. Uh, you know, social emotional learning is, is something that we're really focused on and providing additional mental health supports as we move back into quote unquote, hopefully new normal, whatever that's going to be. Uh, this upcoming school year, but we do know uh, that uh, that's an area we definitely want to focus on providing those, not only those academic supports, but those other social emotional supports that many of our students are going to need, you know, just from being out for so long. Oh, yeah. You know, so that's, that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Any other anything else? Uh, well, I guess we have our next meeting will be in September. Fall. The 12th of September? Fall. fall. Oh, the fall. Okay. <laughs> the fall. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.